Um, well, thank you so much. Um, so my name is Brian Christian, and I'm a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm affiliated with a number of groups there, uh, including the Center for IT Research in the Interest of Society and the Center for Human Compatible AI. And I'm also a nonfiction author of several books for a general audience about the broader human implications of computing and what, in, in various ways, um, what computer science tells us um, about what it means to be human. So my first book is called The Most Human Human. Um, my second book with uh, Princeton cognitive scientist Tom Griffiths is called Algorithms to Live By. Um, and my most recent book, which just came out uh, like a week ago or six days ago or something, um, is called The Alignment Problem. And that's what I'm really excited um, and I'm honored to be here at uh, UCL to talk about um, with you today. So um, I'm looking forward to talking about the alignment problem, both the problem itself and the book um, of that title. So there's, as a place to begin, there's a story that I think it's safe to assume that all of us, you know, who, who work as researchers in ML or, you know, work in AI know. Um, so it's, it hardly um, bears, you know, my illustrating it, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. So there's a story I think we all know, which is just this incredible, uh, you know, almost discontinuous leap that uh, machine learning has made in the last 10 years. And I'm thinking in particular of uh, the deep learning revolution, which, you know, to my mind begins roughly October 2012 um, with the success of the AlexNet model in the uh, ImageNet competition. Um, and I think it is really striking to observe just over the um, eight year span of the ImageNet contest that error rates ended up getting uh, cut by 90% over that period of time. And, you know, even now we already begin to take this for granted, but I think it's very striking to just, you know, look, look at that chart over that relatively small period of time. Um, and in fact, where we are today, uh, you can't even take a picture without a, in this, in the case of the iPhone, an 11 step uh, deep learning pipeline uh, processing that image, right? Doing the exposure, the white balance, the noise reduction, the highlighting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all based on what the camera thinks it's seeing and what it thinks that what it's seeing ought to look like. Um, and the, this success has then in turn propagated into reinforcement learning. And so there's been this incredible boom in deep reinforcement learning. And again, I think we sort of take this for granted, but it's worth, uh, it's worth remembering just how striking this is and the fact that it caught even uh, many experts off guard. So this is one of my favorite slides to illustrate this point. This comes from a talk by Richard Sutton, um, who many, many people know. Um, uh, from 2015, and he was plotting the strength of computer Go programs. And he said, um, projecting this trend suggests a computer will uh, defeat the world champion by 2025. And as we know, it in fact happened something like 18 months later, not 10 years later. Um, and, you know, I, I included this slide for two reasons. One is just to illustrate the, the suddenness of some of these uh, breakthroughs. Um, the other is that there's a UCL connection here, which is that um, I looked into the history of this graph and the first version of this chart was made for Rich by his then graduate student, David Silver, who now teaches at UCL. And I think this is particularly ironic because of course it was David Silver himself who led the team at DeepMind um, that created AlphaGo. Okay, so that's the... That, that's the story that I think most of us know is just this incredible, almost discontinuous progress that's happened in machine learning over the last um, five to 10 years. There's a second story, which I think is um, maybe less dramatic, less celebrated, but equally significant. And that's the penetration of machine learning systems into the actual decision-making structure of society. So. This, for example, is a chart of the number of states in the US that use um, statistical or algorithmic risk assessment scores uh, to assist with parole decisions. 
So this shows you that there's just this incredible um, sort of exponential progress toward the end of the 20th century, which has only uh, continued through to today. Um, and I think this, this point is made very dramatically. Uh, a few years ago, the US Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts visited Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute, and he was asked um, by the university president, Shirley Ann Jackson, can you foresee a day when artificial intelligence will assist with courtroom fact-finding or even more controversially judicial decision-making? Um, can, can you foresee that day ha happening? And Roberts responds, yes, that day is here. And so I think these two trends have really sort of collided. Um, there's this amazing leap forward in what these machine learning systems can do. And there is also this steady and sometimes not fully appreciated um, percolation of these systems <clears throat> throughout society into these morally relevant areas of decision making. Um, and on both of these counts, as we know, people began to feel concerned. Um, and you started to see people speaking up in the press about their worries about things like AGI. Um, people started to uh, really speak out about the kind of present day ethical harms of um, machine learning systems that are deployed kind of um, without, without proper auditing, et cetera, et cetera. But these concerns are hardly new. In fact, they go all the way back um, to some of the earliest pioneers. This is the MIT cyberneticist Norbert Wiener, who has this famous essay from 1960, uh, The Moral and Technical Consequences of Automation. And the way that Wiener puts it in 1960 is, you know, we all know the fable of the sorcerer's apprentice, uh, where the boy makes the broom carry water in his master's absence, um, but he's on the point of drowning when the master reappears. And some of you may know this as the Goethe poem from, uh, I guess, the 18th century. Uh, many of us will know it as the animated Disney cartoon in Fantasia. Um, but as Wiener says, disastrous results like these are to be expected not merely in the world of fairy tales, but in the real world. Um, if we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere once we have started it, then we had better be quite sure that the purpose we put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire and not merely a colorful imitation of it. So this, this concern um, that you know, the purpose that we put into the machine ha had better be the thing which we really desire, um, that ends up being uh, kind of the, the crux, I think, of the present day fears around machine learning. Are these systems learning what we think they're learning? Um, are they generalizing the way we ho hope they're generalizing? Will they behave in the way that we're trying to incentivize them or induce them to behave. Um, and these days we know that problem as the alignment problem. Um, so I think in the minds of many people, the story of AI in the 21st century ends somewhere around there, um, that we've had this incredible leap forward in capability. Uh, a lot of people are coming out and doing the rhetorical equivalent of you know, in case of emergency, break glass and pull the red handle. And people like Nick Bostrom in the case of, um, you know, thinking about superintelligence or people like Kathy O'Neill in the book, Weapons of Math Destruction, thinking about the kind of present day ethical harms um, are doing the equivalent of breaking the glass and pulling the red handle. And I think for many people, that's about where the story ends. But from my perspective, um, this is really where the, the story begins. So I started to notice around 2015, 2016, um, an incredible movement starting to gather at the intersection of these concerns. So we started to see um, you know, nonprofit groups like Future of Life Institute, OpenAI, uh, Center for Human Compatible AI at Berkeley, um, the DeepMind Safety Team, et cetera, et cetera, the beginning of the AI Now conferences, the FAT ML conferences that now go, um, we know as FACT. Um, there was just an incredible gathering of momentum um, at these interdisciplinary lines around these questions of, you know, are, are the systems that we're designing and, and teaching, by example, really doing the things that we want them to be doing? Um, and so I set out to tell that story. 
Um, so I've spent the last uh, four and a half years um, doing as much historical research as I can, doing as much literature review as I can. Um, I did something like 100 interviews with researchers across um, all different parts of the space of this problem. Um, and I tried to pull that story together. And from my perspective, we have many reasons to be worried, but just as many reasons to feel encouraged and proud of the tangible progress that we've already made. So the book itself is really a collection of human stories. Some of them are historical. Um, for example, I started digging into the history of McCulloch and Pitts, you know, the early pioneers of neural networks. And I learned that um, when they wrote their famous 1942 paper, Walter Pitts was 17 years old and homeless. Um, that certainly got my attention. So there were some incredible human stories in the history of machine learning, which I hadn't known. Um, and just as significant, I wanted to really convey the present state of the field. So as I said, I ended up doing something like 100 interviews, and we meet um, all sorts of people throughout the course of the book. And of course, we only have time to really scratch the surface. Um, but I'd like to share a few of those uh, stories with you today. So the book is divided into three sections. The first one looks at questions of bias, fairness, transparency in present day machine learning systems, mostly supervised learning systems, a little bit of unsupervised language models. Um, the second uh, part of the book looks at the origins of reinforcement learning and its connections to um, cognitive science and neuroscience. And the final part of the book looks at what you might call technical AI safety. So um, how we are trying to align uh, sophisticated reinforcement learning systems with human norms, human values. So I'll do a kind of warp speed um, tour through some of the some of the points um, throughout the book. Um, and then at the end, we can, uh, we can talk more about anything that you guys are interested in. Um, so the first chapter is about representation. And that gets into this question of what is actually present in the training data that goes into a system. Uh, it opens with, uh, sadly, one of the my, most iconic failures um, in recent memory of um, a deep learning system, which is the story of the software developer, Jackie Alcine, um, who opens Google Photos in 2015 to find that the new version of the uh, software has automatically created a photo album of selfies of himself and his friend and has given it the caption, Gorillas. So I think this is an example that's probably familiar to many of you. Um, and I think it really uh, triggered a kind of reckoning and a kind of movement within um, the image recognition community. And I think people who have been leaders in this area are people like Joy Bolamwini from MIT, Timnit Gebru from Microsoft Research and Google Brain. Um, they've done some really foundational work on doing sort of intersectional analyses of face recognition, face categorization, showing that in some cases the error rates for dark-skinned females can be 10x or more than the error rates for uh, light-skinned males, um, which has prompted um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of rethinking by the industry itself in, in a comparatively short amount of time. There's been a lot of research on the composition of data sets that researchers use. So for example, Hu Han and Anil Jan from Michigan State um, did a sort of demographic breakdown of the labeled faces in the wild data set, which um, was, was very widely used, particularly at the end of the 2000s, um, beginning of the 2010s. Uh, and they found that not only was the data set 77% uh, male and 83% white, uh, the, because it was compiled from newspaper uh, photographs at the end of the 2000s, the most uh, prevalent individual in the data set is then US President George W. Bush. And in fact, there are more than twice as many photographs of George W. Bush in the data set than there are of all black women combined. Um, so this kind of demographic analysis of data sets has really transformed the way that researchers think about diversity and bias in data sets and the way that, that 
the research community talks about it in, in a comparatively short amount of time. So for example, when the label faces in the wild data set was originally released in 2007, um, the paper that came with it said, this set clearly has its own biases. For example, there are not many images which occur under very poor lighting conditions. Also, because we use uh, this particular detector as a filter, there are a limited number of side views and views from above or below. However, the range and diversity of pictures present is very large. Um, fast forward 12 years, and in late 2019, um, labeled faces in the wild now comes with this giant red disclaimer that says, many groups are not well represented. There are no children, there are no babies, there are very few people over 80, very few um, minority groups have uh, appropriate representation or any at all, et cetera. Um, and I think this, you know, I, I don't mean to pick on this particular data set. I think this indicates a shift in the field as a whole uh, that, you know, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, we were talking about bias and diversity from the perspective of lighting and pose. And now we are thinking about those much more in sort of human demographic terms. Um, this is an issue that affects not just these kind of ethical um, representational harms, but is also a question of physical safety as we start to think about um, autonomous driving and so forth. So I'm stealing a slide here from Andre Karpathy, who's the head of AI at Tesla, um, talking about his lost sleep. You know, when he was a graduate student, he lost, you know, 95% of his sleep over algorithms and models. And now at Tesla, he loses 75% of his sleep over data sets. And I think that's very, um, that's very telling. And sadly, um, this, is, uh, this lost sleep is completely warranted because we've seen some uh, high profile accidents where autonomous vehicles have killed pedestrians. And uh, I remember going through the National Transportation Safety Board review of the Uber accident that killed the pedestrian in Tempe, Arizona in 2018. And one of the things that came out in the review was that the system simply uh, hadn't been given examples of jaywalkers. So this is a question again of the, of the composition of the training set. Um, if all of the pedestrians that existed in the training data were crossing at a crosswalk or at a stop sign or at an intersection, um, then they're, all bets are off when you encounter someone outside of those conditions. So we'll come back to this um, a little bit later as well. I think it's worth pointing out that um, these issues of whether the training data matches the actual deployed environment, you know, this is something that is uh, a concern throughout ML. It's not just a question of these kind of demographic considerations, although that's obviously important. It can also um, be a temporal issue. So one of my favorite results here, um, there was a team of computational linguists that were trying to reproduce uh, the accuracy of a language model in a paper that they were reading. And they, no matter what they did, they could not quite get the accuracy that the original authors got. And so they were trying to figure out, well, what's going on there? Um, maybe there was a bug in their code. Maybe there was some secret sauce the original authors had that they didn't include in their paper. Um, as it turned out, it wasn't any of those things. It was simply the fact that the original paper was written in 2016 and they were trying to reproduce the result in 2017. But the model was trained through these corpora that were being scraped off the web. And it just so happened that the things people were talking about and the words that they were using started to drift over that 12 month period. Um, when they went back and reran it in 2018, the accuracy was even worse. So I think this is a real reminder um, that uh, even training a system uh, with as much data as you can possibly give it, uh, you're still setting yourself up for trouble because the world itself is going to, of course, change. This is something that happens not only over a scale of months to years, but also over a scale of hours to days. So there's another cautionary tale here um, that comes from a, a tech company, name redacted, but um, one, of, one of the major tech companies where they, they were releasing a new version of their app and they noticed that their ad metrics were tanking and they were trying to figure out what was going on. And to make a long story short, they were including the app version number and the operating system version number as features into their ad targeting system. And the ad targeting system essentially identified uh, the early adopter phenomenon of, oh, okay, um, users running iOS 14 appear to have certain demographic attributes or appear to have certain kind of uh, 
uh, consumer preferences, we're going to target ads to people running iOS 14, um, you know, expecting them to be sort of more, more tech oriented, maybe more disposable income, more uh, sort of early adopter mentality, et cetera. But of course that became less and less true, you know, literally every minute that the operating system was out because it was just getting taken up by a greater number of people. So I think this, um, these sorts of cautionary tales are really a reminder that um, it takes a lot of vigilance to make sure that your training data does in fact match the environment into which a system is deployed. Um, and uh, there's a, a word of warning that comes here from Princeton computer scientist Arvind Narayanan, who reminds us that, um, you know, contrary to the tech moves too fast for society to keep up cliche, um, you know, remember there are banking systems, airline systems that still use, you know, COBOL um, and Fortran. And so imagine if models trained today are still in deployment in 50 years, you know, that's a terrifying prospect. So finally, and I just want to touch on this extremely briefly, um, the, the question of representation, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a play on words there in terms of representation of um, people and things within a data set, but also what is, what is the internal representation uh, that a model makes of that data? And so um, there's a whole uh, connection here to language models, you know, word vector models and so forth. And there's been a lot of really interesting interdisciplinary work by people like Eileen Kaliskan um, and Nikhil Garg about how the internal representations of language models show us um, in a deep and uncomfortable way some of the biases that exist within society. Um, and this is one way in which I think these models not, not just despite their failures, but because of their failures, um, offer us, I think, something really powerful from uh, a social science perspective. And so there has been, uh, as some people are aware, this real um, renaissance or boom in, in computational social science as a result of some of these models. Um, okay, so moving on to this question of fairness, um, and, which is really a way of scrutinizing, uh, you know, mo moving the lens from the training data in a model to the objective function of a model. Um, there's been a lot of attention in recent years to the models in the criminal justice system in the United States, led by ProPublica reporter Julia Angwin, who did this uh, very influential study on uh, criminal justice models, uh, in particular one called Compass, and showing that it had seemingly very disparate error rates for black and white defendants and drawing a lot of attention to that, which really kicked off a conversation in the computer science community around how are we supposed to measure fairness in the first place? What is the appropriate way to operationalize some of our kind of civic and moral intuitions? I'm thinking about people like Moritz Hart from UC Berkeley um, has done a lot of work on this with his collaborators looking at these different alternative operationalizations. So, you know, the, the classic one that's been used for many decades is what's called calibration. And that's the idea that if a model rates you an eight out of 10 risk, then you have the same probability to get rearrested as someone else who was rated an eight out of 10 risk, regardless of what uh, race you are, what gender you are. Um, as I say, that's been kind of the classic definition that's been used by criminologists for many decades. Um, and people are starting to explore alternate ways of articulating uh, notions of fairness. So things like equalized odds, equalized opportunity, um, looking at the error rates and saying for all of the defendants that were miscategorized by the model, were they miscategorized in the same way or were they miscategorized in different ways? And this is where uh, models like Compass um, end up showing uh, vastly different outcomes. So if you look specifically at the defendants that are miscategorized by this particular model, um, you see that black defendants uh, are two to one more likely to be overestimated in terms of their risk and white defendants are two to one more likely to be underestimated in terms of their risk. And so that really brings us to this question of can't we just have it all? You know, we have these different competing but sort of complementary notions of fairness, can we just build a model that meets all of those criteria? And 
There's been a lot of research into this by people like John Kleinberg and his collaborators at Cornell, Alex Choldachova at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Sam Corbett Davies and his group at Stanford. Um, and the basic answer is no. Uh, it's mathematically impossible as it turns out if you have different base rates uh, to meet these different criteria of fairness at the same time. So there's a public policy conversation that's happening here um, where the computer scientists are sort of articulating the limits of what we can expect our policy to achieve. Um, there's work uh, by people like Brian Zebart of figuring out, you know, exploring the trade-off space between these different definitions and maybe there's a way we can have most of what we want, et cetera. Um, but I think there's an opportunity also to really step back and ask a bigger question about these uh, criminal risk assessment models, which is what, what are we actually measuring and what are we actually predicting really? For example, um, these models per, are, you know, we think of them as measuring reoffense, and that's what they're supposed to measure, but we can't actually observe reoffense. We can only observe rearrest. Um, this ends up being a very significant difference. Um, and this is something that people have uh, noted for almost a hundred years. So I ended up doing a bunch of archival research into the history of criminal risk assessment models. And it goes back to the 1920s in the state of Illinois. And here's some criticism from the 1930s um, where a conservative lawmaker is saying, now, wait a minute, uh, just because a parolee isn't caught at crime, uh, he's listed you know, in our database as having made good and it's gonna recommend the release of more people like that. That doesn't seem fair. Nowadays, you're much more likely to hear the, um, the concern articulated in the other direction from progressives saying, now, wait a minute, because someone is wrongfully arrested or wrongfully convicted, they're going to be listed in the database as having reoffended, and the model is going to recommend detaining more people like that. Um, and it's the, you know, the political valence has flipped, but it's really the same underlying critique, which is we're not fundamentally predicting the same thing that we can measure. Um, I think it's also worth thinking about this question of truth versus consensus. Um, you know, we often talk about training data as ground truth, but it's important to remember that we rarely have actual access to the real ground truth. Again, we can't measure uh, criminality. We can only measure people getting arrested and convicted. Um, for something like image recognition, um, the ground truth for ImageNet, for example, is not what a picture actually contains. It's what people on Mechanical Turk said that it contains. So if they're all wrong, then the model is going to be wrong and, and, and we'll have no reason to think otherwise. Um, so I think it's, it's important to highlight the question of is something really true or does it just reflect the consensus? Um, it's also important to think about how these models, um, are their predictions being used for the purpose for which they're developed? So a lot of these risk assessment models in the US are specifically designed for pretrial detention. You've been arrested, your court date is set, and are you released before your court date or are you detained before your court date? Um, and they are meant to predict risk specific to that scenario. They're not supposed to be used for sentencing, <clears throat> but many of them are used for sentencing anyway. Um, and so there's an alignment problem there, if you like, between um, the purpose for which the model is developed and the way that it's actually used. So I think it, it may be time for something in the machine learning community akin to what we have in medicine, which is, you know, the label that, the giant label that appears on the side of a bottle saying, you know, take or use only as directed. Um, and I think it's about time for something like that um, as we start to think about machine learning in society. Um, there are many subtle issues here, uh, specifically relevant to criminal justice. For example, um, the Compass tool outputs a number of predictions that are categorized as either risk predictions or needs predictions. So risk would be something like, uh, you're gonna commit a crime if we release you or you're not going to show up for your trial appointment. Needs are things like uh, you have a alcohol dependency issue or you're homeless or you don't have uh, a very robust you know, family or support structure. Um, and these things are, this, there's kind of an HCI, you know, user interface design thing here where the risks are designated with red and the needs are designated as green because 
Um, those are things that, you know, that society should help you with. They're not um, punitive, uh, you know, ideally. Um, and yet in practice, many judges actually just use the needs scale as another reason to lock someone up. Um, finally, I think it's really important to think about what do we do with the prediction that a model gives us? Um, if, if we have a model that can perfectly predict something, um, there's still a question of what do we do with that prediction? So for example, um, the police department in Chicago was using a, a predictive policing system that was able to identify a group of about a thousand people that had a 100x likelihood of being victims of homicide. And this model turned out to be accurate, um, but they never could figure out what to actually do. You know, so you identify a thousand people. Um, homicide is sufficiently rare that even if you have a 100x risk, um, a very small percentage of those people, like less than 1%, are going to be victims of homicide. So what do you do? I mean, do you just send an officer around to their house, tell them, you know, be careful? Um, so I think it is important to think about that sort of last mile problem of actual machine learning systems. And the same thing is true here for risk assessment. So we make a prediction that someone is not going to appear to their court appointment if we release them pending their trial. Well, what do we, let's just assume for the sake of argument that's an accurate prediction. What do we do with that information? Well, you can of course incarcerate that person and that will ensure that they appear for their court appointment. Um, you could also release them and send them like an SMS the day before the, their trial, reminding them that, that they have to appear in court the following day. Um, and there's a growing body of research suggesting that that works pretty well. So again, I think there's, um, it's really important to bear this question in mind of what is, what is the system predicting, but then how is that prediction actually getting used? Because in some ways, um, a lot of the, the really key questions um, are happening there in that interface, if you will, the sort of membrane between the model itself and society. Um, finally, uh, there's the question of transparency, right? We all know that deep learning systems in particular have this um, reputation for being black boxes. And I think interestingly, that reputation is becoming less and less deserved over time. And there are many, I think, incredibly encouraging stories of, of work being done here. Um, to sort of frame the problem, uh, I tell the story of Rich Carwana, who's uh, at Microsoft Research. Um, in the 1990s, he was part of a project with a uh, group of hospitals in the Pittsburgh area to develop machine learning models to predict whether a pneumonia patient should be released, you know, allowed to go home for the night or held overnight. And the uh, neural network ended up winning, but he recommended that they not deploy the neural network. And part of the reason was they had also tried a rule-based model. And the rule-based model had learned a very strange rule, which is that if the patient has asthma, then we should treat them as lower risk and release them. Well, that doesn't really make sense. You don't have to be a doctor to realize that doesn't really make sense. Um, it turns out that this is a real correlation in the data. Asthmatics that have pneumonia um, have slightly better out health outcomes than the general population, but that is only because they are considered so risky that they get the highest priority care. And this is exactly the care that the model would deny to those patients. Um, and so the thinking was, well, surely if the rule-based model learned this, then the neural net did too. And in fact, the neural net has probably also learned a bunch of other bad stuff that we don't even know about. And so they ended up not using it, even though it was the most sort of nominally accurate. Well, there's been uh, you know, 20, 30 years of progress since then on methods for kind of popping the hood and figuring out what's going on inside a neural network and using that to determine uh, this alignment question of has the, has the network actually learned the thing that you think it has? Someone I think of as having done a bunch of amazing work in this area is Chris Ola, um, who has been leading the Clarity team at OpenAI. Um, and he's done work, for example, on um, using uh, image classification models in a sort of generative way where you can show them an image of static and then fine tune the static essentially to create these super stimuli that maximally activate a particular category output. Um, and when you do this, you know, it's kind of a sanity check on is the model really internalizing what you think it is. 
So, you know, anemone fish, banana, parachute, screw, that all looks about right. Um, but they were looking at a particular model. I think it was one of the Google Inception networks, if I recall correctly. Um, they looked at the category of dumbbell. And what they noticed was that when you output these kind of super stimuli for the category dumbbell, the dumbbell comes with this giant muscular arm, kind of this disembodied arm attached to it. Um, that's interesting. Um, it, you know, it, it really is true that dumbbells are most often uh, to be found at the end of a flexing arm. You know, that's, that's a real thing. Um, but it suggests to us from a kind of, you know, potential safety standpoint that our model uh, is probably not reliable at identifying dumbbells that are on the ground or on a rack. Um, so models like, um, you know, transparency techniques like this, I think, are a real asset to uh, catching some of those problems before they actually go into production. Um, some of these issues can be incredibly subtle. For example, um, Bean Kim, who's developed a model called TCAV, some of you may be familiar with it. We can uh, talk about it more later if you're interested. But um, her work has shown, for example, that if you look at um, some of the, you know, the train models that Google uses, the concept of something being read is intrinsic and uh, critical to its classification of something as a fire truck. Uh, well, that makes sense if you're in the US. It probably makes sense if you're in the UK. It doesn't make sense if you're in Australia, where fire trucks are white or neon yellow. So again, um, these sorts of transparency techniques, I think, provide a really valuable sanity check. Um, there are um, there are some really interesting user studies, however, that offer us a note of caution, that a reminder that transparency is not necessarily an end to itself. And one of my favorites comes from Faroo Persabzi Sangde and Jen Wortman Vaughn at Microsoft Research. Um, they were doing some studies where they were showing users a model that predicted home valuations. In some of the conditions, it had a small number of parameters, in others, it had a large number of parameters, and some the coefficients were obscured and others they were you know, made uh, visible. And one of the things that they found was if you show the user a model that has fewer features and the coefficients are transparent, the users report that they trust the model more. That makes sense. That feels intuitive to me. But they report that they trust the model more even in the conditions where the model is way outside its training distribution and basically outputting garbage. So they trust the model even where they should not trust the model. So I think actual human user studies are invaluable. Um, and they remind us that uh, you know, even the question of transparency is not so simple. And you know, ac actual human uh, studies are, are critical here. OK, so the, um, the middle third of the book shifts the focus from supervised learning and unsupervised learning to reinforcement learning. And Again, I don't have to tell uh, you know, the UCL Center for AI about the history of reinforcement learning and its use in you know, game playing, robotics, self-driving cars, et cetera. I do think it's interesting to point out um, because I think it's not quite as well appreciated how reinforcement learning is making its way into commercial tech. So this is a white paper from Facebook in 2018 talking about their use of reinforcement learning to deliver notifications and things like that. Um, and I think it's very interesting, um, just as a kind of a historical curiosity, that the model that they talk about using is DQN, which is the same, the very same architecture that DeepMind used for their Atari paper. Um, so there's a sense in which, um, you know, fa Facebook is literally playing us like an Atari game, um, you know, with with the exact same model and everything. Um, so the alignment problem in a reinforcement learning context is, of course, about the reward function. Does the reward function capture the thing that you really care about? And does optimizing for the reward function generate the behavior that you're hoping uh, for the agent to exhibit? So there are many, many famous cases of this going wrong. This is from OpenAI, they, their boat racing uh, agent, which ends up getting distracted by this infinitely replenishing um, cul-de-sac of power-ups and completely ignores the race that it's supposedly trying to win. Um, there is a very deep connection between reinforcement learning and neuroscience and cognitive science that um, this part of the book touches on. 
And I think one of the most celebrated examples is the connection between temporal difference learning and the dopamine system. So some of you may be familiar with this story, but in the 80s and 90s, we were starting to get um, much higher resolution data about the activity of dopamine neurons, but it, there was a huge mystery of what it actually meant. It seemed correlated with reward, but it wasn't reward. It was correlated with surprise, but it wasn't surprise. Um, well, all it took was someone like Peter Diane, who had worked on TD learning, um, to look at the data and say, nope, I know exactly what that is. The brain is doing TD learning. And you know, fast forward to the present, and that is still the accepted story for the role of dopamine in the brain. So there's an incredible interdisciplinary story here about the connection between reinforcement learning and uh, our understanding of the human mind. And I also have to highlight here Rob Rutledge of UCL, who has done some really amazing work on subjective happiness and its connection to the dopamine system. And again, I think there's a, a really vital role for um, machine learning researchers to play here at that intersection. Um, one of the things that comes up for anyone who's doing RL, as again, I'm sure you know, is this question of reward shaping. Um, so in the book, there's this wonderfully colorful history of where the term shaping comes from, and it has to do with uh, pigeons in a bowling alley. I won't spoil that particular story, but in the ML side, um, there's this question of, we're trying to incentivize an agent to do something. You know, we add these little incentives to the reward, but so much of the time it ends up blowing up in our face. And there are many, many tales of this. I, every researcher has their own stash of these sorts of tales. Um, one of my favorites is a group of Danish researchers in the 90s that were uh, developing an RL system to uh, ride a virtual bicycle to a destination. And they decided to add this shaping reward that was you know, a certain number of points anytime you were making progress, forward progress toward the destination. Well, how did that blow up in their faces? The agent just learned to ride circles as quickly as possible because they forgot to subtract points for progress away from the destination. And it was a lot easier to just ride in circles really quickly than to actually learn how to stabilize the bike and go forward. Another similar tale comes from David Andre and Astro Teller, um, uh, who is now the head of Google X, but in his grad student days, they were working on a robotic soccer competition and they decided to add a shaping reward for taking possession of the ball. Sounds reasonable. That's a nice precursor to learning how to score because you have to have the ball first. Okay, sounds good. What's the loophole? How did that blow up in their faces? Well, the robot learned to approach the ball and then vibrate its paddle as quickly as possible in order to maximally rack up these uh, uh, added shaping pseudo rewards for taking possession. It would just take possession of the ball over and over and over again. So this has led to a lot of um, work in computer science, but it's also very deeply connected to the question of incentives um, and incentive design, which has a long history in economics and management and so forth. Um, and I highlight the story in the book of University of Toronto economist Joshua Gans, uh, who had a bunch of um, very recognizable problems trying to incentivize his children uh, to be potty trained, where they would, uh, they would ruthlessly find the loophole in whatever incentive he designed um, and exploit it. So, uh, you know, parents are no, no strangers to this phenomenon, just the same way that RL researchers are. There's been a lot of interest in the theoretical commu computer science community on how to do reward shaping without modifying the optimal policy. Um, and Andrew Eng, Daishi Hirata, Stuart Russell um, have done some seminal work here. And it's been very interesting watching some of that work on incentive design um, make its way back again from the computer science community to humans. So there's a movement um, over the last 10 years led by people like Jane McGonigal to think about gamification of, of human systems. How do you create a system of rewards um, in order to get out of other people or out of yourself some behavior change that you want to see? Um, she used it in her own life to fight depression, um, and many people use it you know, to, for all sorts of reasons. There's been an increasing interest on the cognitive science side. So people like Falk Leader at Max Planck Institute, Tom Griffiths at Princeton, in using some of these ideas from computer science um, to think about optimal gamification. Um, so how can we use some of these ideas about reward shaping 
to think about uh, what would be the uh, provably optimal set of incentives to give someone to complete a particular task. Um, and that has huge uh, ramifications for things like procrastination and so forth. Um, finally is the question of intrinsic motivation or what do you do when there simply aren't enough rewards in the environment to begin with? Um, so we've seen, for example, how DQN uh, struggles with video games like Montezuma's Revenge that have really sparse rewards. Um, how do you do the requisite exploration in order to find even the first reward of the game? Um, and this is a, a very interesting area in RL. And it's yet another place where we are seeing these really deep resonances between the computer science side and the human side. So we have people like Mar Mark Bellamar um, at uh, Mila and Google Brain at DeepMind, uh, people like Deepak Pathak at UC Berkeley and Carnegie Mellon, um, doing some of this work on borrowing ideas essentially from developmental psychologists, um, you know, cognitive scientists that specialize in children. So people like Alison Gopnik at Berkeley, Laura Schultz at MIT, um, who are developing these formal models for things like curiosity, exploration, play. Um, these then get borrowed by the RL community. And now suddenly we're able to beat video games like Montezuma's Revenge that we couldn't before because we've been able to actually incorporate some of these ideas um, as uh, intrinsic motivation for our RL agents. So there's, I think, an incredibly exciting and rich dialogue that's now starting to happen uh, between these two fields. And just as we are borrowing these ideas from cognitive science, the machine learning community is also able to sort of give back formal models that are improving our understanding of why infants play the way that they do. So I think that's an incredibly rich uh, and exciting area. So finally, and I know, um, I know time is, uh, is running short, so I'll try to speed up here, but um, the final third of the book looks at this question of technical AI safety. How do we align uh, very uh, powerful or flexible um, RL systems with human norms and human goals, things that are um, perhaps too uh, subtle or nuanced to actually specify directly in a reward function? Well, of course, one of the answers here is imitation learning or behavior cl cloning. Um, there's a very deep cognitive science here showing that uh, humans have this incredibly deeply wired capacity for imitation. Um, they can imitate facial expressions 40 minutes after birth. And this is without ever having even seen their own face. So they're doing this cross modal matching of what you look like with how they feel. Um, and this appears to be totally hardwired. So um, this, you know, this is a deeply rooted evolutionary strategy. And this is something, of course, we're seeing as well in robotics and so forth, you know, Tesla's have this thing that they call shadow mode, where even when the autopilot is turned off, it's secretly running in the background, constantly evaluating what it would do if it were driving the car, and then comparing that against the way that you actually drive in order to get this error signal. There are a lot of really interesting problems here and ways that behavior cloning can go wrong. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, these ideas of, you know, cascading errors and um, there's a computer science, you know, arsenal of how do you deal with that problem and people like Stefan Ross at Waymo, Drew Bagnell at Carnegie Mellon, um, algorithms like Dagger, for example. There's a very interesting connection between um, some of these issues in imitation learning and some of the philosophy literature on things like uh, so-called possibilism versus actualism or virtue ethics. Um, so I think it's very interesting that in, in parallel to some of these problems that are coming up in imitation learning, um, there is this 40 year long debate in ethics about you know, whether you should try to imitate the behavior of people who are more ethical than yourself and uh, the ways that even those good intentions can go totally wrong. Um, so one of the ways to kind of um, make progress when you can't, um, you know, directly specify the reward is to just take some actions in an environment and have a system infer what reward you appear to be pursuing. So this is again, familiar, I'm sure, this idea of inverse reinforcement learning, um, people like uh, Stuart Russell, Andrew Ng, Peter Abiel, um, you know, you can drive a car in a simulator and 
it may be very difficult to parameterize, you know, a behavior cloning system such that it can do what you would do in all situations that occur on the road. But it might be comparatively simple to train a system, um, an IRL system to say, okay, this person uh, tries to keep in the left-hand lane. They try to keep their a safe distance from other cars. They try to follow the speed limit, et cetera. Um, and this has been really successful. Um, it's, there, there's a number of flagship examples, I'm sure are familiar, you know, helicopter stunts where you can attempt to do a stunt. And even if you can't successfully execute it, uh, it might still be possible for the system to realize what you are trying to do and then directly optimize for that and do a trick that you yourself can't even do. Um, we're seeing this now extended into, um, you know, even subtler domains. So people like Chelsea Finn, for example, guided cost learning, um, you can start filling dishes in a dish rack and the system will start to get the idea and complete the dish rack for you. Um, there's this question of what are the limits of demonstration? So not everything that we want, we can actually demonstrate. So are there ways to do things like IRL with, without the ability to even demonstrate the behavior we want? Um, there's been some really exciting in my mind work um, this is probably familiar to at least some of you from DeepMind and OpenAI on showing users uh, pairs of videos and saying, in this case, which of these two video clips looks epsilon more like a backflip? Um, then the system starts to model what it thinks your notion of a backflip is and then optimize against that inferred reward model. Um, and it turns out that after just uh, 900 comparisons, 900 bits of feedback, which is really not much, the system can do these perfectly gymnastic backflips. So that to me is really encouraging. Um, it's, a, it's a very hopeful sign that our systems are going to be able to internalize some of these ideas that um, you know, we can't specify directly numerically, we can't even demonstrate. All that's required perhaps is that we know it when we see it. So this idea of inferring rewards, um, this goes back uh, I think that this, there are connections here to where we began, which is this question of you know, failures in image recognition. It's worth, you know, people like Stuart Russell have, have noted that uh, image recognition systems use you know, this cross entropy loss where implicitly every miscategorizing as, of X as Y incurs an identical penalty. Um, but if you think about it, you know, that's, that's probably not the right loss matrix to have. Um, in fact, some miscategorizations are probably a million times worse than others. So perhaps we should treat the loss matrix itself as this kind of IRL problem where we need to figure out which sorts of miscategorizations are more harmful than others and then optimize the system against that. Um, we're starting to see people like Smith and Milley and others, that, um, people from the theoretical computer science community that work on things like IRL now partnering with tech companies and um, for example, she just did a project with Twitter um, looking at uh, ways to optimize for community engagement without ever having to explicitly define what metrics you know, constitute a healthy community. So I think there's a real promise for models like this to kind of liberate us, if you will, from the tyranny of the world of KPIs. So it's my hope that you know, IRL systems will have a, a major role to play even in, in commercial tech. So finally, and just to wrap up is the question of uncertainty. So um, arguably the world was basically saved or at least hundred million people's lives were saved in the 1980s when a Soviet missile officer named Stanislav Petrov um, failed to deliberately you know, refrain from telling his superiors about a missile strike that his computer system was reporting because the missile strike just didn't fit the profile of what he was expecting a strike to look like. Um, now, this sort of capacity is, I think, increasingly crucial in RL systems. Um, we sometimes hear this called robustness to distributional shift. This is Dario Amade of OpenAI. Um, if a system finds itself operating on data that's out of the distribution on which it was trained, uh, it should know that, ideally and have some kind of reaction. Um, uh, you've seen a similar uh, emphasis on uncertainty uh, placed by uh, researchers at Berkeley on this idea of corrigibility in, in RL systems that you know, in order to have a system that 
will permit itself to be shut down, it has to have some uncertainty about the objective that it's actually pursuing. So this may end up being very important in AI safety, for example. Um, and there's been a lot of, I think, really exciting and encouraging computer science work here. So people like Tom Dietrich from Oregon working on what he calls the open category problem. How does an image classification system know that it's seeing something that doesn't fit any of the categories um, that it has in its output? Um, people like Yaron Gall and Zubin Garmani working on Bayesian neural networks that have these calibrated notions of their own uncertainty. Uh, people like DeepMind's Victoria Krakowna thinking about how models can estimate the probable impact of the action that they're about to take and sort of, um, you know, show the appropriate amount of caution proportional to the impact that their action is actually going to have. And there are some incredible resonances here um, from computer science, again, back into the human sphere. So um, in medical ethics, uh, Gregory Holt at the University of Miami had a patient come in who was unconscious, who had a tattoo that said, do not resuscitate. Well, he can't ask the guy because the guy's unconscious whether this tattoo reflects his sincere worry, uh, wishes or not. Um, so what do you do? How do you take a consequential action in the face of uncertainty? Uh, the same thing comes up in legal philosophy. People like Cass Sunstein have looked at preliminary injunctions and um, the notion of irreparable harm as it exists in the law. And then philosophers like Will McCaskill, Toby Ord have been exploring this idea of what they call moral uncertainty, which is how do you take an action in the face of not even knowing the right moral framework from which to evaluate the action, but you still have to do something. Um, and I think it's increasingly the case that um, you know, computer systems, as they become more flexible and more widely deployed into society, start uh, really needing to have that capacity for essentially self self doubt that that we humans have. So, um, in conclusion, I, I think we really are writing a new chapter into the history of AI. Um, these questions of ethics and safety have converged. Um, there are a lot of kind of hypothetical issues that are now becoming real issues that we're seeing in society. Um, I think we have honestly every reason to be concerned but also every re reason to feel encouraged. I think solving the alignment problem will be arguably the defining scientific story of the next decade, if not century. Um, and it will draw on all sorts of expertise and require as much brain power and insight as we can bring to it. Um, and I think it also offers us, as I've tried to illustrate a little bit, a profound and revelatory opportunity to learn something about ourselves along the way. So my mind goes back to uh, this 1952 radio um, panel that Alan Turing was a part of. And he's talking about, you know, I've been doing these early, early experiments and teaching a machine and, you know, it goes very slowly. The machine's always learning the wrong thing or getting the wrong idea, or it's not going fast enough. And I, I have to keep intervening. Um, and his co-panelist interrupts him and says, well, but who was learning Turing, you or the machine? And Turing responds, well, I suppose we both were. And I think, that's a, that, I think that's the moment that we're at now. And so I think that's a great place to leave it. And with that, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much.